So it's a great pleasure. Of course, I'm going to present work from Los Alamos Quantum Dot Group. Um, and uh, the focus uh, today is going to be on uh, what's happening in the LASIK field. So I'm, I'm going to actually, since I have, seems like I have a lot of time, so I'm going to do introduction. I'm going to talk about theory of lasing, history of lasing, and of course, I'm going to talk about uh, most recent developments. And these are kind of the important milestones. So this is first demonstration of their uh, lasing, which happened uh, back in Moscow in our group in 91. Then uh, that was uh, 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 glass-based nanocrystals. Then moving on to or colloidal quantum dots, colloidal nanocrystals, 2000. And so something which happened quite recently um, in our group, that was observation of amplified spontaneous emission. And this is an uh, important step towards uh, the quantum dot, colloidal quantum dot laser dies. So a demonstration of structures which can operate as both optically pumped uh, lasers and electrically pumped light emitting dyes, LEDs. So not lasing effect yet on the electrical pumping. So that's just the challenge, which I'm going to discuss how to get there. Okay, so in general, of course, uh, the field of the quantum dot lasing, uh, colloidal quantum dot lasing is uh, part of a bigger effort on realization of um, lasers and specifically electrically pumped lasers, laser dyes with solution processable materials. And of course, there is a lot of uh, existing lasers, but with colloidal quantum lasers, for example, or for that matter, with polymer lasers, you can do something which here would normally are very difficult to do with uh, free five lasers, for example, realization of on chip uh, devices when you do not have constraints due to lattice mismatch, for example. Okay. Of course, that would contribute to a traditional area of optical communication. Um, and again, this is something new people have been uh, thinking about that using in lasing effect for ultra high sensitivity, uh, chemical or biological sensing and uh, medical field would also greatly benefit from that. So if you can think about actually lasing devices, which are based on some flexible substrate, which is directly touchable uh, to your body. And you know, there are also some crazy ideas using, uh, for example, lasers, uh, <laughs> this crazy applications, lasing nail, Polish, right? All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, colloidal nanocrystals, colloidal quantum dots, so ultra small uh, particles, which occupy uh, the size range between clusters where you have uh, reconstruction uh, of the lattice and bulk systems. In uh, the nanocrystal, you have essentially uh, the, uh, the crystal lattice, which is very similar to what you have in the bulk, but at the same time, sizes are very small. And that leads to quantization of electronic energies. And that's uh, the key feature of nanocrystals, which are often referred to as artificial atoms. So you have discrete energies in the uh, conduction and then the valence band. And importantly, these energies depend on the size of uh, the particle, and that leads to the size dependent band gap, uh, which has a bulk contribution in size dependent quantum confinement term, which scales directly with the size. So it's one over radius squared, the smaller the particle divided the and gap, and this is early illustration how you can use that to tune, for example, emission color from cut selenite quantum dots. Smaller particles would emit in the green. You make particles larger, and the emission uh, gradually uh, shifts uh, to the yellow, orange, and then red. And if you combine size control with the composition control, then you can see you can access essentially all energies from far infrared with for sixes such as lead selenide all the way to the ultraviolet with systems such as cadmium sulfide. So it's quite attractive uh, for applications. Okay, I promised a little bit of history, how everything started. It started back um, at, uh, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s with this man, Alexei Kimov, who worked at uh, Science Saint Petersburg at Yofa Institute, and uh, he was working on uh, semiconductor doped glasses. Okay, so this is how bulk uh, selenite looks like, so it's the band gap is narrow, so it uh, looks like a piece of uh, uh, black rock. Uh, but uh, this is a sample from Yekimov's lab, which surfaced in our lab uh, back probably at the end of the 80s. Okay, so these are nanocrystals of cut selenite dispersed in glasses, and they were treated at different temperatures, and you can see that leads to this gradually changing color. And Alexei actually realized what uh, was happening. So it was quantum size effect when the absorption onset was dependent on the particle size. And that led to this color change in the absorption. First nanocrystals, they did not emit light, but they clearly showed 
uh, this very nice uh, effect of quantization size dependent band gap in the absorption. And uh, then we worked with this type of samples from the team of uh, using transit absorption, where we were able actually to resolve not only this size dependent band edge, but again, gradually saturated various electronic states, we were able to visualize uh, different transitions. Okay, so you pump at low pump levels, you saturate the band edge feature, you see it here, you pump harder, you go saturate the next transition, which is due to the first excited electron state, 1P state, and even harder. And you saturate uh, the next, start saturating the next shell, the D shell. And, and that happened very early in the day. So it's, if you look at the publication date, it's 91. Okay. And of course, these days we have commercial uh, colloidal quantum dot samples. At that time, you could also buy them commercially, although you wouldn't realize that were quantum dots. This is an example of their filters, these colored filters based, based on uh, two six semiconductors. And this is just the transmission characteristics uh, from the catalog. When you buy the filters, you have the catalog. And of course, uh, when I started um, in the optics lab, I uh, looked a lot at the characteristics of these filters. Only at that time, I didn't realize. So these filters contain quantum dots, OK? So if we like focus here, this is shown in terms of the transmission. This is 100% transmission. This is absorption age. OK, now if you rotate that, kind of start looking in terms of the absorption, you see one S peak, OK? And after we realized that, in fact, in some serious studies, we used already just commercial filters. filters and this is, uh, for example, um, one example, serious studies, by exciton effects, right, in nonlinear femtosecond transmission, especially the first paper, which actually clearly uh, saw uh, this uh, short-lived bicytons and uh, some changes in the absorption, like the absorption uh, age shift due to the bicyton. And these studies were conducted using these commercial, commercial samples, commercial filters, right? Uh, KC19, that was this very beautiful signature of the bicyton early times after photoexcitation. Something what people now regularly used in the lab in order to, for example, look at the bicyton binding energy and to identify the characteristic time of intraband relaxation. Yeah, these days, of course, uh, most of the work uh, is done with solution-based colloidal samples. Okay, so they've been uh, around for a while. So uh, a lot of work done, early work done in Germany, Hang, uh, Hang Lein, uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, Bruce Nozick. Uh, but if, uh, the field took off uh, with this publication published by MIT Group in 93. So it's uh, Chris Murray, David Norris, and Munji Bavini published a beautiful prep, okay, demonstrating uh, very well controlled synthesis of two six uh, colloidal quantum dots. Uh, this paper was devoted to three compounds cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide, and cadmium chloride. Eventually, this paper has been adopted. Uh, for many other semiconductor materials and even oxides and metals. Okay, so uh, really nice prep. So it allows you to control sizes and uh, leads to very narrow dispersion. So it's allowed around 5% in a massive colloidal sample and 5% for a particle of 20 angstrom size. That uh, means that you have uh, around one angstrom deviation in size, right? So it's not uh, even probably, I mean, it's about one semiconductor monolay, maybe two semiconductor monolays. Of course, you look uh, now, um, uh, at linear absorption. And you remember with the team of samples, we could see the shift of the absorption edge, but in linear absorption, we couldn't see features, right? And to do that, we did transit absorption measurements, but uh, with this type of samples, you can actually uh, resolve all these discrete features due to quantized uh, transition in even in linear absorption without uh, this complex transit absorption measurements. Right, of course, again, the key feature is nice emission, and that was important again um, in this paper. So uh, the samples which were synthesized by this colloidal method, they were emitting, not very high uh, initially, but then people learned how to enhance quantum yield, and especially important was uh, work by uh, by Heinz and um, USCNA. They developed nice prep uh, of overcoating of uh, calcellanite uh, quantum dots with zinc sulfide shell, and that allowed to boost uh, quantum efficiency to more than 50%. Eventually, uh, people learned how to and uh, to, to move even further uh, with the quantum will to values, which these days can be nearly 100% for some of the uh, materials. And of course, okay, people thought about uh, doing something useful uh, with this uh, emitting quantum dots. Uh, 
highly emissive uh, color tunable and uh, a few companies worked on um, applying that in displays and uh, television and this is a commercial reality of course these days you can go and buy a tv for example samsung uh, uh, has uh, come uh, with uh, probably one of the first commercial displays based in in UFOS white quantum dots um, and um, in this type of materials, quantum dots um, serve as a color converting species, so they convert the uh, original emission of the gallium nitride and gallium indium uh, nitride uh, diet into two colors, green and red, and that allows for nice, very high color uh, quality uh, compared, for example, to the uh, YAC phosphor, which has been used uh, traditionally in this type of applications with down conversion. Of course, there is a lot of work uh, now on other fronts. Some of that is very close uh, to commercialization. This is an example of two companies, spin-offs uh, from our group. This is Hunter McDaniel has been working on color converting films and uh, they primarily focus is on greenhouses. So just adjusting the uh, color um, of emission um, so that uh, emission fits uh, the absorption spectrum of the chlorophyll and that seems to stimulate the plant growth and this is um, like a more classical applications again this is spin-off started uh, by Sergio Brovelli and they uh, think um, have a pilot plant in Trento so working on uh, on uh, sunlight collectors with um, so-called luminescent uh, solar concentrated approach when uh, quantum dots are embedded in a glass, semi-transparent glass, absorbed light, and then remit light. And light is guided along the plane uh, of this uh, glass slab or plastic slab, and is collected uh, by the PV devices at the edges. Okay, so this is a very classical application. So it's a lot of uh, theory uh, and work on dyes has been done in this area, and that seems now that uh, quantum dots work uh, somewhat better than, for example, traditional dyes. Okay, uh, a lot of work is happening on um, electrical activation of uh, quantum dot emission, and that would uh, lead, of course, to light emitting diets. And uh, these days, um, uh, efficiencies are uh, very good. So internal efficiencies are 100% nearly, and external efficiencies are only limited by the light extraction coefficient from a high index medium. Typically, quantum dots are incorporated in these devices as a very thin one to two monolayer. Uh, uh, structures, this electric lay sandwich between hole and electron injecting electrons. It turns out if you have only just one or two monolays, that's enough to squeeze out uh, your LED, extremely high brightness is of about 1 million candela per centimeter square. We have now pulse devices, which operate at the levels of 10 million candela per centimeter square. So, so because you can really quickly recycle quantum dots and get a lot of light from them. Okay, lasers. Again, that's primary topic of my uh, today's uh, lecture. And uh, again, a lot of work has been done. I showed you first observation back in 91. Um, uh, then uh, first demonstration of the effect with colloidal particles since 2000. And again, I'm gonna discuss that in greater detail. And these days now we're working on trying to make a quantum dot laser that, okay? So combining the ideas and methods which have been developed within the LED film with understanding of uh, the lasing effect developed uh, based on the structures uh, which were activated primarily optically, trying to combine this and uh, demonstrate a functional quantum dot laser diet, laser which operates under electrical injection. Okay, so that's a big challenge, and hopefully, we will uh, tackle this uh, soon. Um, okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about why we actually working um, on quantum dot lasers, we as a community. Okay, there is a, <clears throat> a very detailed review just um, appeared uh, in Nature Review materials. Um, in fact, like officially, it was published in the beginning of the year online and officially it came out yesterday or the day before yesterday with a nice uh, cover. So if you're interested in uh, like more detailed uh, overview of uh, the colloidal quantum lasing field, I recommend to read this review paper. But again, so uh, why people are interested uh, in lasing with this structure, so-called zero dimensional structures where carrier motion is uh, restricted in all three dimensions, uh, there are actually fundamental physical reasons for that. Okay? In this case, your bandage can only accommodate two electrons, right? The bandage state, and it turns out, in this situation, it's very easy to obtain population inversion, right? Your 
uh, populate the band H levels with one excitone and you excite the second excitone and you go in the lasing regime. We're gonna talk about that and it turns out that greatly uh, reduces the threshold. Okay? This is the dependence of the uh, current density theory published in these uh, two papers. Uh, current uh, uh, threshold for the lasing effect depending on dimensionality. So it's bulk system, okay? So this is film, this is quantum well wire. This is one dimensional. Uh, structure and box. This is the quantum dot. Uh, this is zero dimensional structures. A notation from the original paper, which was published in this 1992 uh, APL. And you see, this is logarithmic scale, and the threshold actually go very quickly down logarithmically. So it's potentially you can realize the lowest possible threshold using these zero dimensional structures, colloidal quantum dots, and that on top of this advantage of uh, continuous color tun tunability allowed by size. And there's another advantage. So the um, in principle should show extremely high temperature stability, which is important uh, in the lasing field that your wavelength does not drift as yes? the temperature of your device changes and in quantum dot it fixed, it fixed by this bandage state. There is no way for carriers to go outside. Okay, so they kind of the localized on the bandage levels. Again, this is again the historic result, which I mentioned. So it's the paper in 91, where we, uh, for the first time, observed the lasing effect. It was this glass type sample and they were larger quantum dots. Okay, so they were producing some light actually. And we just uh, uh, polished uh, the samples in our, at uh, Moscow State University optical work, uh, optical shop, and they put the dilated mirrors on, on the edges and the, in, looked at the sample under optical pumping at low temperatures. So we didn't see effect of lasing at room temperature, but at 80 Kelvin, we saw the falling. So we saw this uh, emission, uh, which was in the intragap region. That was uh, very typical of this sample. So a lot of uh, emission comes from the intrabag trap. It was just a little bit of bandage emission. And then we were increasing the pump level. Okay, this is uh, the spectrum uh, like artificially uh, increased by factor 50. Okay, so the emission shifted uh, to the bandage. This is the onset of amplified spontaneous emission. So it's emission accelerated. And so the uh, emission was happening from the bandage before carriers had a chance to be trapped in the intergap states. And then the pump levels were increased further and that transformed into this lasing beam. So, the, so this rapid increase, sharp increase in the intensity and development actually of directional beam. So that were clear signatures of the lasing effect went back in 91. And in epitaxial quantum dose, the observation of the lasing effect they happened a bit later, so about three years later. So the first demonstration of actually lasing with zero dimensional structures uh, was done with uh, glass embedded uh, nanocrystals. Okay. So it, as I already said, it took quite a bit of time. So about uh, 10 years in order to demonstrate the lasing effect with very small colloidal particles. Okay, so we did it work using samples which were synthesized by Catherine Lefferdale. Uh, at that time, she was doing a PhD uh, with Munchi Bavendi at MIT. Okay, so why it took so long? Okay, because we didn't quite understand the physics of the effect, and again, with our first demonstration, we were somewhat lucky. Okay, he used very large quantum dots because that was the dot which were producing some light. Okay, but as you go to smaller sizes, turns out. Uh, you've got to deal with this important phenomenon of a recombination, non-radiative process, and uh, uh, realization of the importance of this effect came all at about, you know, 99, 2000, after we figured it out, okay, so the immediately, the same year, we demonstrated light amplification. So we demonstrated the effect of amplified spontaneous emission. Okay, so let's uh, try to connect the dots. Okay, so why of every combination and uh, effect of lasing are connected. Why you need to think about of every combination a lot in order to realize quantum dot lasers. Okay, that relates to the mechanism of optical gain in the structure. So, and we're going to consider a very simple model. So, this is two level model um, of a quantum dot um, in the ground state. It contains two electrons with opposite spins. So, spin up and spin down. Okay, this is very important. Okay, so this is twofold degeneracy of the bandage levels, at least. In fact, it's even higher in, in most of the semiconductors. Okay, now let's um, uh, promote one of the electrons from the valence to the conduction band. This electron can emit light. Okay, so you can obtain very high 
photoluminescence efficiency, ideally 100%. Unfortunately, the state does not amplify light because light amplification defines the response of the material to the incident photon. So if you send a photon onto this uh, structure with one exciton, so it's going to stimulate the transition of this electron down with generation of a photon. But unfortunately, this electron is going to absorb this photon. The probability of these two processes is identical, meaning that you are not absorbing, but you're not amplifying either. So this is corresponds to the regime of optical transparency. So if you excite in your sample every quantum dot with one exciton, you cannot amplify light, but you're going to get a transparent sample. So that corresponds to the gain threshold. In order to get to the regime of light amplification, you've got to excite the second electron across the bandage. You have to create a bioxiton. In this case, if you send a single photon onto the system, you're going to get two photons. You're going to get into the regime of light amplification. And this is why Auger effect becomes important, because if you deal with two excitons turned out, simultaneously with optical gain, you turn on Auger recombination, this electron can recombine with this hole and this recombination energy does not produce a photon. Instead, it's transferred either to the electron or to the hole, which is present in the same quantum dot. And the problem is that this effect is crazy fast. Okay, so it occurs on the picosecond time scale, depending on the size. I'm going to discuss it a bit in greater detail uh, in the next slide. Okay, and a radiative lifetime of a single exciton, this state is 20 nanosecond and about five nanosecond for this state. So this time constants are much shorter than either of these radiative time constants. So that means that by excitons are virtually non emissive And that's kind of this paradoxical situation. We're trying to get light from nominally non emissive species okay so the quantum the emission is about, is about one percent okay and this is the original solutions how we dealt uh with this problem okay so luckily okay in order to obtain lasing uh, we rely not on spontaneous but stimulated emission and the rate of stimulated emission depends on how many emitters per cubic centimeter you have okay because in the case of stimulated emission one particle in our case quantum dot stimulates the other and the denser uh, the sample uh, the faster is the rate of stimulated emission so we at that time in 2000 uh, we knew the Roger recombination lifetimes and we just estimated how much material in the sample we need to get in order for development of stimulated emission outpaced uh, the OJ recombination turned out we didn't need we did not need much so about one percent volume or more and um, it turns out that chemically in the solution it's impossible to obtain typically due to solubility limit you're always lower in the sense of the volume fraction of semiconductor you, or in your sample because of the solubility limits and that's why many people who try to achieve lasing effect in solutions did not succeed. What we did, we took the samples, which we obtained from Kefiron and Lefferville, we assembled them in closed spec film. Okay, so the packing density was well above uh, this threshold value. So it's about 15 to 20%. So we excited this film with short pulses in order to overcome um, the effect of the faster G recombination during the pumping stage. We needed to pump faster. Okay, so we prepared quantum dust and the bioxiton state. And uh, at this very high density, the development of stimulated emission was faster. Okay, then the OJDK and we observed this feature uh, showed up in our spectra, very, very bright feature. This is amplified spontaneous emission, light amplification due to the bioxitons. You see that it shifted from the peak of the single exciton to the red, and this is due to this bioxitonic binding energy. Okay, so for a long, long time since 2000, okay, so that was the primary way to obtain lasting in these structures to assemble them, any type of colloidal structures. Okay, so it's colloidal particles, near spherical particles, cubes, rods, uh, tetrapods. You assemble them in a solid state film, you pump with a short ten per second or picosecond pulse, you get uh, the effect. Of course, it's not very convenient, right? So you want eventually. Uh, for commercial, especially applications, a CW laser, you want a laser which is pumped electrically in the DC regime, okay? So, and we worked very hard. So how we can actually resolve this issue of the fast or recombination that something what we did with spectral control of um, your quantum dose. This paper was published in 2000. 
seven. Okay, in this paper, we demonstrate that in principle, if you design correctly your structure, you can get uh, lasing, uh, not necessarily with by excitons, you can get uh, the lasing effect or the effect of amplification with single excitons, okay? So, but in this system, you need to introduce very strong exciton exciton repulsion, and you remember, so the problem, okay, with the lasing is that uh, you have competing effect of absorption uh, from the electron, which remains in the ground state, okay? So the emission from the excited electron okay, is, absorbed by the electron which still resides in the appendage state. But let's assume that uh, you have very strong exciton, exciton interactions, and then the transition energy for this absorption event is gonna be different from the emission energy. Okay, and in, in order to take advantage of that, you wanna shift your transition up in energy. In that way, you place the emission in the band gap region, right? So within the region where there's no absorption features, that, that means that you need to realize somehow exciton, exciton repulsion, okay? And it turns out it's possible, it's possible with specially designed quantum dots. It shouldn't be a monocomponent particle. It should be at least a two component particles which produce so-called type two confinement regime, okay? In the type two confinement regime, if you excite exciton and the energetics of the structure works such a way that electron goes in one part of your heterostructure structure and hole goes in the, the other part of heterostructure. structure. Okay, if you excite the second exciton, you're trying to create the bi-exciton, these electrons and holes do the same. Now you're forcing now two electrons co-reside in one region. So you increase this effect of electron electron repulsion, same happening for holes. So you increase whole hole repulsion, but at the same time you separate charges of the opposite side across the HG interface. So you reduce the effect of attraction. And it turns out using this type two approach, you can achieve extremely strong repulsion of about 100 MeV. That's what you need because your repulsion much, much, must be bigger than the line width and homogeneous line width of your transition, which at best for quantum dots is about 50 MeV, right? And we did this, we did that with coarser structures. So synthesized by Sergei Ivanov. So it was cut sulfide or uh, overcoated with a zinc selenite shell. And this is a very nice structure where you have electron confined to the core and the hole to the shell. So you realize this chest separation, which you want to enable this giant effect of repulsion. And when we assembled uh, this type of samples into a film, we increased the pump level. We looked at the uh, development of amplified uh, spontaneous emission. This is what we saw, okay? So you see, this is the spontaneous emission band due to single exciton. You increase the pump level and now amplified spontaneous emission. This is typical line narrowing and this uh, fast nonlinear growth happening right at the center. So you have the effect of light amplification due to this single extonic transition. You pump harder, Okay, and now you see amplified spontaneous emission due to bi excitons. So you see now the amplification due to this transition. But look here, now it's a, to a high energy from the single exciton, you indeed are looking at repulsive bi exciton state. And the energy of the repulsion, as I said, is about 100 MeV. So 2 volt here, 2.1 volt here. Okay, so it works nicely over certain problems, of course, with this effect because you cannot get. Uh, large gain and your gain is very narrow at the bandage. Of course, you want to take advantage of all transition in your uh, material in the quantum dots in order to achieve strong and broad band gain. And for that, you need to deal with auto recombination. Okay, and, uh, about five years ago, we decided actually to look uh, directly um, uh, quantitatively at the effect of uh, auto recombination on the lacing and optical gain threshold. And uh, actually, theory of such system didn't exist at that time because uh, laser people don't like to work with materials with stronger Jerry combination, especially with materials in which Jerry combination is the dominant effect, right? So we had to do this theory and for, um, in order uh, to come up with the theory, we considered uh, this model system, what I call truncated harmonic oscillator model. It's only considered the states of direct relevance to band H light amplification, the system includes a ground state, okay? Single exciton state, you remember you promote one electron across the band gap and by exciton state when both electrons are promoted uh, to the excited state, okay? So what is important? Again, if you look at this problem from the physical perspective, you immediately see, as I already said, that a single exciton is gain neutral because you remember the probability of stimulated emission 
and the probability absorption for a single exciton state are identical. Okay, so exciton is gain neutral in order to produce optical gain. You need to excite the system in uh, the uh, by exciton state, and that leads to a very peculiar uh, description of so-called population inversion. Population inversion is a difference in the population in the typical say two level system between the excited and the ground state. In our case, we have three states and the population inversion is the difference in the occupancy of the bi-exciton state and the ground state because this state is changed Newton kind of couples two states together. So it's really a nice feature of this model kind of correctly describes the physics and that immediately leads to this uh, situation when you see that the population inversion lifetime is defined by the bi-exiton lifetime. Okay, so that's important feature also of this model. Now we did the modeling. Okay, you can do a little bit of analytical uh, modeling in certain limits, but most of the modeling we've done numerically, putting our quantum dots into the lasing ca uh, cavity and uh, considering now the changes in the population of the quantum dots and the photon modes. Okay, and so on that, um, using this model, we were able to calculate uh, the threshold for the lasing in the regime of CW pumping, continuous wave pumping as a function of the bi lifetime, because that's the critical parameter in this whole lasing business, especially if you think about CW applications. Okay, if you look at the standard quantum dot, again, the combination is very fast. And again, for moderate sized dots, it's typically around 550 to 100 picosecond. Again, not specially designed dots. And then you look at the threshold, you see that's the threshold for activation of lasing is 10 to the six of watt per centimeter square. So it's one megawatt per centimeter square. Of course, you're gonna burn your sample in order uh, uh, to get to the pump levels, which uh, can be sustainable by uh, with the quantum dot materials. And that would be about kilowatt per centimeter square, preferential less. You need to somehow extend the bi external lifetime to one nanosecond. Okay, so um, uh, can we do that? Okay, so back in the days, again, going uh, to this original observation of this quantized Roger recombination in cadmium selenide quantum dot, this early paper, which preceded our first demonstration of um, the lasing effect with a colloidal quantum dot, we saw this interesting trend. Okay, so you make the quantum dot larger. Okay, these are samples again made by Catherine Lefkowdale and the uh, Roger lifetime was increasing. Okay, and it turned out that uh, it was a very clean trend for all states. We looked at bi-excitons, um, uh, tri-excitons, and even four excitons, and we observed this uh, beautiful scaling uh, with the radius group or uh, the nanocrystal volume. And later on, we saw that this effect is quite general. Okay, so that uh, paper was published in 2009. The nanos later, and we, here we looked at um, uh, many different uh, type of semiconductors, not only different size, but actually different compositions: two six cat selenide, three five indium arsenide, uh, four six lead selenide, and uh, germanium. Again, in the bulk, of the constants would be uh, different by six orders of magnitude between indium arsenide, for example, and germanium. But as you make them in the form of nanocrystals, small size colloidal nanocrystals, this is what you see. So there is a conversion, there is universal trend and that's kind of important. So this is what we first observed in 2000, so-called this uh, generic, this scale turns out is a very general trend. In, in fact, again, if you're looking at the uh, lifetime, it turns out you can very accurately estimate the bikestone lifetime if you calculate uh, the volume of the nanocrystal of quantum dot in nanometers Cubed, and that would be a lifetime of a bioxytons in picoseconds. For example, if you have uh, quantum dots uh, with one nanometer radius, okay, the volume of um, uh, this nanocrystal would be in about four nanometers cubed, and the Roger lifetime would be about four or five picoseconds, right? Now you increase the size, say you go to this limit, you know, which typically hard to exceed with colloidal structures, especially more than a component radius five nanometers, again, cube of uh, five is 125, so pi divided by one, so it's about, so you're gonna get about 400, maybe 500 picoseconds, right? So you increase, of course, with real lifetime, but with five nanometer radius, you are close to the size of the bulk exit on bore radius uh, in cadmium cell, and so you're losing the properties of quantum confinement, right? So you're pretty much dealing with the bulk system, so you, uh, it's not what's gonna help you. So therefore, in order, for example, for the first time to realize 
uh, uh, CW lasing, um, uh, this is what has been done. This is the work which is primarily done in Toronto by Sargent. We also helped, Sargent and co-workers uh, helped with um, a little bit of modeling and single dose studies. And, um, and uh, the, 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 there's also a kind of contribution from Rosenthal's group that, that did a lot of imaging. And that was kind of interesting study. And with cat cell and cat sulfide system, you know that you can go to really big sizes, right? So it's nice, nicely uh, latest mesh materials. Okay, so you can uh, uh, grow large sizes. Uh, and uh, pretty much just taking advantage. Plus there is also effect of or suppression on uh, more complex uh, reasons. And I'm going to discuss that a little bit, but it turns out that the standard kind of the cut cell net cut sulfide system with a thick shell, you can get uh, to the Roger lifetimes so about 700 picoseconds. Again, according to our model, which I described the threshold is going to drop to a few kilowatt per centimeter square. And this is important and the practical demonstration of the effect indeed showed, yes, this, structures uh, showed CW <coughs> leasing at about 10 kilowatt per centimeter square. But again, the size was large. Okay, tunability is a problem. Stability was a problem. Okay, even with these large sizes and this type of the time constant, these structures showed the leasing effect only for limited time, about 10, maybe 15 minutes. Okay, so we need a more complete suppression uh, in order to realize stable CW or lasing with colloidal structures, especially it's important if we think about uh, DC electrical pumping, something what uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a bit later. All right, so let's um, look at that again. So let's try to be more creative. Can we use something else, not just size, in order to tune Roger? A lifetime and turns out such approaches exist. Okay, this is an important paper published by Sasha Efres and uh, and his postdoctor at that time, Greg Craig, uh, in Lan Nano Lattice, uh, uh, 2010. They considered the effect not only the size but uh, the shape of the confinement potential, so called smoothness of the confinement potential. They looked again that were model calculations at a structure with a sharp uh, rectangular profile and then they progressively softened the potential going. Uh, ultimately to this parabolic profile. And they observed this very dramatic trend, right? Uh, regarding the rate of recombination, they observed that uh, in the case of the softer structure, the rate of recombination could be reduced by orders of magnitude, okay? So, and uh, this uh, phenomenon again relates, you uh, can understand that uh, if you account for the fact that um, in the OJ recombination event, you have two transitions. So you have a transition of the electron from the conduction to the valence band. And this transition is coupled to this intra-band transition where either an electron or hole is re-excited to higher energy a state within the same bed. And this state is characterized by this highly oscillating block uh, harmonic and the efficiency of this process depends on the overlap of um, uh, this state with the band H state. It's easy to look at this, uh, e uh, understand, it's easy to understand this effect if you go to the Fourier space. So for the Fourier harmonic, you have this uh, very narrow profile in the Fourier space around this special harmonic, high special harmonic. And um, importantly, um, that the shape in the Fourier space of the uh, this uh, ground state of a function depends on the steepness of the potential for the sharp potential, uh, you have this large extent of the harmonics, right? Large extent in the Fourier space, but if you make potential smoother, uh, you actually narrow uh, the distribution in Fourier space. As a result, the overlap of course gets reduced and that leads to the effect of the suppression of uh, Auger recombination. And first time we observed this effect um, in uh, this classical cut cell night cut cell phase structures, they're grown for a long time and uh, many, many hours, tens of hours, in fact, days in order to grow the, uh, this uh, cut sulfide chain layer by layer. And of course, a lot of things may happen during the time, and particularly you can have this uncontrolled alloy forming this cut selenide uh, sulfide alloy. And uh, we looked um, at the occurrence of this randomly uh, formed alloy using uh, you know, fluorescence line narrowing measurements. And Sergio Bravella was actually doing these measurements. And uh, what he saw, he saw correlations between the amount of the alloy and the degree of suppression of a recombination that seemed to correlate it, of course, with these predictions of the Sefferson's theory. Again, of course, um, you know, in order to take full advantage of this effect, you want to do not like random alloy, you, you want to do intentional alloying. And it turns out the system, which is really well suited for that, is a cut selenide core structure combined with a shell of cadmium zinc selenide. Okay, the problem with the cut sulfide shell is that it confines uh, the hole but does not confine an electron, so electron is delocalized across uh, the entire quantum dot. So you cannot grade 
uh, the electron potential if you make cadmium selenide sulfide, but if you use cadmium zinc selenide, you can grade both. You can both, uh, you can grade the electron potential and you can grade the whole potential. This way you can achieve very strong separation of the recombination. You can get to energy lifetimes of longer than two nanoseconds. And you remember I showed you kind of critical values around one nanosecond when things get much better when you go above one nanosecond. And in these structures we achieve again 2.4 nanosecond which a lifetime, the quantum yield in the emission of Blackstone was all, almost 50%. Again, you remember, again, the beginning for standard quantum dots, typically it's 1% or less. So instead of now non-emissive bioxidants, we have highly emissive bioxidants, and that was completely changes um, the rules of the game. We can do a lot of fun work, and particularly we uh, can uh, try to work with charged species, charged excitons instead of neutral excitons for realizing optical gain and lasing. And it is actually shown from earlier studies when people tried uh, to use bulk semiconductors in order to achieve ground state transparency. Okay, so again, remember, so this um, reason we need to buy exciton is twofold. Uh, the generacy of the band -age transition and first exciton, what it does, it transforms the system into the transparency by blocking uh, the band -age transition, then you excite uh, the second electron in order to enable optical gain, but it's possible just by doping completely block the bandage transition, you put two electrons using chemical doping or photochemical doping as I show you in the next slide. So you can completely uh, block this transition that leads to this very uh, peculiar uh, optical light or uh, light amplification uh, regime with zero threshold. So it's zero threshold optical gain. This is how we Actually, uh, uh, this is what we put on the title of this paper. Okay, now you're immediately at the gain threshold. It's uh, now enough to excite uh, just arbitrarily small number uh, of single excitons in order to enable optical gains. And uh, the excited exciton, actually, you have to put uh, the carry in the P state and you put uh, the hole in the bandage one state. And this state already can amplify light and they um, implemented these ideas in 2019 in this paper using photochemical uh, charging. Okay, it's direct, uh, di directly, it's kind of difficult uh, uh, to charge uh, the quantum dots. You need a significant reduction potential, but um, if you work uh, with the photo excited quantum dots, you photo excited prepare a hole, and this state, of course, is much easier to reduce, and uh, you don't need very um, active uh, compounds for that, and we use super uh, for uh, reducing this hole and uh, producing this negatively charged quantum dots. Again, this is not what we invented. This is uh, Dan Gamelin did that first, and uh, we just uh, borrowed this procedure. We modified it because we're working with fixed structure. So it's in order for this procedure to work, we need to do certain tricks to protect our quantum dots and to allow actually significant charging despite uh, uh, the light shell. Okay, so then uh, now pretty cool experiment. So now we're actually making a real laser. We assemble our quantum dots on distributed feedback resonator. This is so-called second order distributed feedback resonator where you have the feedback along the grating, but the output light it out coupled in, in the vertical direction. So-called surface uh, emitting distributed uh, feedback uh, laser, DFB laser. Okay, so we're putting that in TFH and then we uh, add the control amount of super high right? Okay, before we put anything, okay, we're exciting uh, this system, okay, with approximately one exciton per dot, and this is emission which we see, okay, essentially there's no lasing, just a little bit of light coming over the quantum dots. Okay, we don't change the pump level, okay, so essentially the sample remains on the excitation, you just drop superhydride and uh, you add that and see what's happening, so lasing develops immediately, very, very sharp bend, okay, single mode lasing, and you can actually drop now the pump level, the threshold actually drops to about half exciton per dot, so it's below the fundamental limit for neutral external lasing. That's the beauty, okay? So you don't need that much pump power in order to activate charged external lasing. Okay? And of course, now you can expose your sample uh, to where you can gain, uh, neutralize uh, your charged quantum dots, okay? And then you can charge it. Okay? And in this case, we're charging with more amount of superhydrate and uh, the threshold drops even further. Now it drops to approximately uh, point 27, so it's less than uh, uh, just one photo. The quantum dot is excited with a single exit, and the rest is unexcited, but we have just really good lasing behavior. All right. 
so and of course, um, using this quantum dot with strong disappressive recombination is key when we think about uh, realizing uh, lacing with electrical pumping. Let's look now a little bit at the model of um, electrically uh, pumped device. So again, something what um, I'm going to talk about, uh, we kind of borrow from a lot of research done on the quantum dot LEDs, but uh, quantum uh, dot laser diet, uh, we abbreviated as QLD, is a little bit different beast. Okay, so we're describing the model in greater detail in this paper in Nature Photonics, which is going to appear uh, very soon, we just got acceptance note this week. So um, again, you were working with a standard laser, okay, so a standard light emitting diode. So what happening typically, if you work the so-called inverted ar architecture, where you inject electrons from zinc oxide into cut selenite and uh, hole from some organics, okay, uh, typically the structure tends to first inject electrons. So it's almost spontaneous injection of the electron, and then um, you add a hole. Okay, so this is how, and then you have this radiative recombination again. So essentially, you circulate this, your structure between these three states. You start with the uh, ground state. Okay, no excitations at all. Then you have singly charged uh, dot with electron. Then you have a neutral exciton, and then it uh, decays radiatively uh, to return to the ground state. It turns out uh, that in a typical um, LED device, which operated currents even of one amp per centimeter square, very high currents. This is when you can get half million candela per centimeter square. Uh, you only have a single excitons, just 10% of the dot contains single excitons, the rest is in the ground state, okay, or in the single electron state, okay, and you don't have bi excitons at all. So with a standard type of currents, the current density is one amp, even two amp per centimeter square, it's impossible to get uh, to the bi exciton regime, which you require, which you need in order to enable optical gain. So in order to realize a QLD regime, the laser time regime, you need a completely different excitation cycle. Okay, so you need to circle your quantum dot between single exciton state, a negatively charged exciton, negative train, and a bi exciton. Okay, this is your excitation cycle. Okay, so in order, to, for example, to realize so-called half saturated gain when you have half of the dot in the singly <coughs> excited single exciton state and the other half in the bi exciton state. So you don't have, almost don't have uh, unexcited dots at all. So you circulate your quantum dot entirely in this red region. Okay, so this is completely different excitation cycle. Okay, so this is one challenge, okay, how to enact this excitation cycle, which seems to require extremely high current density, as we're going to discuss the number in the next slide. There's another challenge, okay, so of course, okay, in order to enact uh, lasing, you need to combine your LED design with the cavity, okay, and then you need to put these mirrors, which are going to circulate your photons in such a way as not to disrupt charge injection pathways, okay, so you want to integrate a cavity, which does not hurt your LED performance, <clears throat> and importantly, again, you have to have enough material, enough number of quantum dot lace in your device in order to have an optical gain which is sufficient to overcome losses and there's a lot of losses in your led because you have a lot of charge conducting lace and typical LED design is a single quantum dot monolay so the so-called model model gain is extremely small so you need to increase the thickness in this way of course again that's going to be deviation from a standard LED design okay so three challenges right so one challenge how to circulate your dot along this uh, red circle, okay? So how to actually get into this regime, how integrate a cavity in your LED and how to make an LED work very well at high currents with fairly thick quantum dot layer, which is sufficient for producing optical gain, which can outcompete all losses, which you have in your system with a lot of lossy layers. Okay, let's talk numbers. Okay, so in order, again, we have a model in this paper um, in order to get to this um, type of uh, half saturated optical gain, which is roughly we use as a proxy of the lasing threshold. Okay, you need the excitation rate, the quantity which is measured in one over second, uh, which is KLC inversely with the bi lifetime, because that's what you need to introduce to bi, bi Okay, 
So we can convert oxidation rate into current densities using electrical cross section. Again, something that again we introduced. We actually introduced that in the paper we just published in Nature Review Materials, but again, we discuss it more in this paper. Okay, so if you have this quantity or uh, electrical uh, cross section of your quantum dot, you multiply it by the current density divided by the uh, charge of the electron and you obtain the uh, this excitation rate. And um, now for half uh, saturated optical gain, you can convert this excitation range, rate <coughs> into, uh, into the, this kind of the threshold uh, current density. Okay, And you see that it scales inversely uh, with the bikes on lifetime and with electrical cross section. Here, <coughs> it's an important point. I'm trying to express the electrical cross section, something which we can measure, something what we can see. Okay, naively, you would uh, think that electrical cross section is pretty much defined by the geometrical cross section. So, a quantum dot is a barrier, electron hits, and that's where we're going to stop it, the <coughs> uh, quantum dot. But turns out, we're actually going to benefit from this shell of organic ligands, which are insulators due to these ligands. The current is kind of focused naturally for the quantum dots, and that leads to the enhancement of the electrical cross section versus uh, geometrical cross section by this factor, factor aerial, factor, uh, aerial uh, feeling factor. Okay, and typically for uh, quantum dots of moderate size, it's about 0.5. Okay, so now again, we have all the parameters. We can try to uh, run the estimations for the standard dots. We're gonna use dots of moderate size, about three nanometers. Okay, filling factors, aerial filling factor is about 50%. The typical bifurcation lifetime for these dots is about 110 picoseconds. And you calculate and you get this uh, current densities of 2.5 kilo per centimeter square. Okay, so it's insane number, very high very high compared to the standard currents which uh, you use in order to run a quantum <coughs> dot LED. So we need something uh, which we can reduce uh, these current densities to something which it can be sustained uh, on the long term by the quantum dots. And um, you have two parameters to modify it, right? You can extend, try, you can try to extend their Baxton lifetime or you can, or and you can enhance geometrical cross-section. Okay, and that's of course happening again with this type of quantum dots, which I was talking about. Okay, so these are cadmium selenide quantum dots enclosed in this gradient, cadmium zinc selenide shell, okay, thick shell. So we increase the size easily to nine nanometers. And this is where we have great enhancement uh, in the geometrical cross-section, but importantly, okay, so our lifetime is increased. Um, our lifetime is increased to 2.3 nanoseconds, and overall lifetime, if you account for radiative process, is about 1.3 nanoseconds. Again, you use these numbers and you immediately get this. So instead of two about kilo, kilo per centimeter square, you will just to about 20 per centimeter square. So 100 fold reduction, okay? Uh, to enact lasing, this is to realize half saturated gain, but to get to the threshold, you need even lower, okay? In this case, you need about seven M per centimeter square. Okay, still it's kind of higher what you have in standard colloidal quantum dot LEDs, but it's reachable if you use, for example, current focusing, something what we did in this paper in 2018, okay? just limiting the charge injection area by introducing this uh, lithium fluoride aperture in the whole injection path, reducing the injection area to less than 100 micrometers. In this case, we could maintain high current density up to 20 m per centimeter square, and that was sufficient in order uh, to observe uh, optical gain. Okay, so how we run these experiments? First, we um, looking just at electroluminescence, we excite with progressively higher current densities, and we are here below one amp, and you see traditional type of emission spectrum arising from this band age transition. But you go above one amp, you go to 10 amp per centimeter square, and you see this little bump appearing on the high energy side. And this bump actually means a lot. So it signifies that you've completely saturated one S transition and you go with your carriers now into the excited 1P state. But most importantly, so you have now two excitons for quantum dot. And that means that you realize the citation of the optical gain. And again, you can compare 
what you see in the electroluminescence with photoluminescence, you're excited uh, with femtosecond compulsive because it helps you to quantify the actual number of excitons you excite in the quantum dot. And for this regime, it's more than two excitons per dot. And you remember the gain threshold is one exciton per dot on average. Of course, you can run direct amplification experiments, or you use a tunable laser to transmit for the quantum dot, and then you modulate your uh, bias. You can get in this way absorption of the sample unpumped unexcited sample and electrically excited sample, you take the difference. And you see that uh, in the case of the biased sample, you see the development of the negative absorption coefficient and that implies optical gain. And importantly, again, this gain band develops exactly at the position of the bioexciton inhibition. So you are able to realize bioexciton gain with electrical injection. So that was extremely important work which showed feasibility of uh, exciting optical gain with uh, electrical current. Okay, so how are we gonna realize the quantum loop laser? This is what's happening in the group right now as we speak. Okay, so we need to integrate the cavity. Okay, and this is what we're pursuing. We're pursuing DFB cavity, something what I discussed in the context of charged exciton gain. It's uh, fairly easy to integrate that in grave into the bottom transparent electron, IT electron. Importantly, you have to use not a standard ITO, we're making a different ITO, a so-called low index ITO, we're mixing ITO with silica in order uh, to reduce the index of these materials, otherwise uh, your mold is going to be pulled from a thin quantum dot layer, okay? So now uh, there's going to be a, a real measurement. So this, um, this is the structure which mimics an LED design. We have um, an ITO, okay, with this engraved uh, grating. Okay, we have a um, zinc oxide layer, we have, uh, which is uh, electron uh, injection layer, we have a quantum dot layer, and we have this hole injecting organic electron. Okay, so we're exciting this structure optically. Okay, so we have only three monolays of quantum dots in this case, and you calculate the mode confinement factor at about 20 uh, percent. So you have just uh, one fifth of the materials gain, but turns out it's enough. Okay, in order to obtain a good lasing effect, this is real structure. Again, this is uh, what we have, right? So this is low index ITO with engraved grating, zinc oxide um, electron transport layer. It's it has this modulation quantum dot layer red. Okay, so it modulation is actually disappears on the top. It's good so we don't have holes. And this is TCTA, our hole injecting layer, right? We're pumping optically and we see the de development of the sharp lasing line, okay? Uh, the threshold is kind of high for, well, it's a good threshold, 60 microjoule, but in how good device we can actually work with thresholds about three microjoules per centimeter square, but that's good enough. Actually, it can be realized also with electrical pumping um, as I show later. Right now we're supplement the structure by the uh, top um, hole, in, uh, hole injecting electron. That would be a metal and mold oxide, aluminum. This is what we're using, and the structure shows bright electroluminescence. Okay, so now we're trying to crank up the current in order to get to the optical gain with electrical injection, but our devices, again, at that time, when we published this paper, were quite resistive, and so we see this breakdown. Okay, breakdown before we can actually reach uh, the gain threshold. Okay, so how to overcome this problem, and this is the solution we came up with very recently. Okay, now we use not one-dimensional, but two-dimensional current focusing. Yeah, and that's achieved very, really straightforwardly. So in addition to this aperture, this linear aperture in the lithium fluoride, we just use a thin aluminum injection there. Okay, so we have now a cross and that leads to this two-dimensional current focusing. Further, we're using pulsed excitation. Okay, and uh, with uh, pulsed excitation, where you use one microsecond uh, pulses, we can get to currents, okay, 10 to the six milliamp Per centimeter square. So we are, we are running uh, right now extremely high current densities. So 1,000 m per centimeter square. Okay, something which have is unheard of uh, for standard LEDs. And of course, this is well enough to invert the system, not only totally well enough to invert the bandage one s transition, which we saturate, it's well enough to achieve the saturation of the P emission. We are 
inverting both the bandage transition and the next transition. Of course, this is ideal because we have a lot of optical gain in the one P band. And right now, in order to realize actual lasing effect, we are working with structures which uh, exploit both uh, gain band. And I believe uh, our successful demonstration will eventually be on the one P transition. All right, and um, again, um, for, a lot, for a while we've been working on this, um, laser diet puzzle uh, with colloidal quantum dots. Okay, important steps, development of these dots with strongly suppressed OJ recombination, which shows highly emissive bicytons with bicyton emission efficiency about 50%. Okay, development of this current focusing architecture in order uh, to realize high current uh, DC devices. And uh, the next step, realization of extremely high current densities, which are enough to invert both uh, 1S and 1P transition using pulsed one microsecond uh, pulses. And this is not exactly pulse, this is quasi uh, kind of DC case because microsecond is still longer than any recombination constant in the system just helps us to reduce the heat flow into the system. And of course, we now learn how to put the cavity into the working LED without disrupting the charge injection pathways. It looks like that we have uh, all these pieces of the puzzle and uh, we are hoping that we're going to have a functional laser diet in our lab very, very soon. Right, and uh, future, of course, uh, seems to be bright. So, of course, we work on cut selenide, but eventually, I hope all of these quantum dots, which show this wide range of sustainability, will be accessible uh, in the lasing regime. And, of course, uh, somebody, I hope, will be interested in exploiting this phenomenon in real life applications, such as realization of on chip lasers. Right, these are people who have been working on the lasing project recently. Um, so a lot of credit goes to Jai Hun Lim, the guy who developed this gradient quantum dot with strongly suppressed array combinations. So worked closely collaborating with Yong Chin Park, just Piktoski piece, Jen Kyun Ro learned how to put a cavity uh, into quantum uh, dot LED without uh, disrupting the injection pathway. So he developed these dual function devices which work as optically pumped lasers as an LED kaifeng Wu. Um, did a lot of work on charged exit on gain, and uh, Oleg uh, Kozlov took that further and demonstrated a really good laser, very low threshold laser, which exploits this charged uh, optical uh, gain approach. And Igor Fedin uh, prepared dots for both of these guys uh, for their studies. Um, and this is most recent effort, okay, so work uh, on a practical implementation of, um, uh, of the laser diet here on uh, Jung developed uh, these devices with 1,000 amp per centimeter square. And I'm young and actually working right now on combining everything together and putting this puzzle together. His devices, which have everything high current, a cavity, beautiful dots. Um, and I think uh, very soon, very soon, we're going to report that it's working. And uh, Jun Duke has been making beautiful quantum dots for these guys. Right. Again, if you want to learn more about, um, a colloidal quantum laser, um, uh, please uh, read this paper. If you don't have ac access to this uh, Nature U material journal, just send me an email, I will send you the paper. All right, and this is <clears throat> a call to the group as a whole. It's still kind of old picture. We need to take this picture uh, for the post-COVID uh, times. And uh, okay, the, uh, over the time, we graduated a lot of people. Now they're everywhere, including, of course, Italy. 